Hello and welcome to Nanobyte. Today we are going to integrate the FAT driver that we wrote a few videos back into our operating system. We're gonna make some improvements to it and we're gonna learn a lot more about the debugging. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's jump straight into the code. Something we haven't done in stage 2 yet is to implement the discrete method, so let's start with that. As a software developer, when writing any piece of code, it's best to think about how a user would want to use it, and to design it in such a way that it's intuitive to use and easy to reuse. As the user of a disk API, we don't want to know anything about the internals of the drive and how it works, we just want to get the data as quickly as possible. So let's design these disk functions in this way. An object-oriented approach would work great here, but since we are working in C, we will simply implement a disk structure that will contain all the internal information about the disk and we will pass it to each function that deals with disks. By not storing anything globally, we can also access multiple disks in parallel without any kind of issue. For the actual functions, I created two. Disk initialize will initialize the disk given to us by the user, and discrete will read the number of sectors requested using logical block addressing. In part 2, we use the BIOS interrupt 13 hexadecimal to read from the disk. Today we will do the same, but this time we are going to call them from C. The C language doesn't have any mechanism to call processor interrupts, so we will have to write a wrapper in assembly that we can call from C. We did this a few videos ago for the print character function, and today we will do it again for the disk functions. Let's begin by declaring the functions we will use in x86.h. First we have the reset function, which only takes the drive as a parameter. Then the disk read, which takes the drive, cylinder head, sector, a sector count and a pointer to the data buffer. We'll also use the getDriveParameters function so that we can get the disk geometry without relying on the boot sector, which could get corrupted. This function will return the drive type and the number of cylinders, heads and sectors. Now let's implement these functions, starting with the simplest, the reset function. I started by declaring the global symbol and adding the call frame setup on cleanup. This is the documentation page for the reset function. Speaking about documentation, one of the most exhaustive resources you can find about BIOS interrupts and general low-level stuff is the Ralph Brown's interrupt list. It was available in the 90s as a DOS program, but today it can be found on various websites online such as this one. Of course, it hasn't been updated in years and a lot of stuff is no longer relevant today, but it contains a treasure trove of information, especially about older 80s and 90s hardware and software. To call reset, the only parameter we need is the drive number, which is passed through the DL register. The function returns the error code in AH and sets the carry flag if there's any error. The implementation is pretty straightforward. We just get the drive number from the stack at BB plus 4, set AH to 0, set the carry flag and then call interrupt 13 hexadecimal. I didn't care about the error code, so I just return a boolean true for success and false for error. The BIOS sets the carry flag to 0 for success, so to invert the result we just need to set AX to 1 and then subtract the carry flag by using SBB or subtract with borrow. Next we have the disk read function. I copied the code from reset because a lot of it is the same. Here is the documentation for the read disk function, so we can see what parameters we need to set. The drive is in DL, so this looks good. Then we have the cylinder, the lower 8 bits are in CH and the upper 2 bits are stored in the upper 2 bits of CL. Next we have the head, which is stored in DH. The sector is passed through the lower 6 bits of CL, so we should apply a mask first to make sure that the other bits are zero, and then we can OR it to CL, so it is merged with the other bits. The count is passed through AL, and finally the pointer to the output data in ESBX. 
After setting AH to 2, we can finally call in 13 hexadecimal. Because we modified registers BX and ES, we should save them and restore them before returning as mandated by the CDECL calling convention. Finally, we have the get drive parameters function. This will be useful for getting the drive geometry, meaning the number of cylinders, heads and sectors without relying on the boot sector. To call it, we just need to pass the drive in DL and set ESDI to 0 to guard against some BIOS bugs. And the function will fill out all the registers with juicy information. After calling the BIOS interrupt, we need to return all the parameters through pointers. The way we do this is by loading the address given to us through the pointer in a register, such as SI, and then storing the result into the memory referenced by SI. This way we return all the parameters, the drive type, the number of cylinders, sectors and heads. After saving and restoring the modified registers, PX and SI, we are finished with these assembly wrappers. Now we can continue implementing the disk functions. For initialization, we will call the get drive parameters function and if it fails, we return false. Hmm, looks like I declared the BIOS disk functions as returning void. Let's quickly fix that. Next, we just need to store all the information we have in the disk structure and return true. When reading from the disk, we prefer to use the logical block addressing. This means that we have a single number, which specifies the sector number, which goes from 0 to whatever the disk size is. The BIOS read function expects us to give it three numbers, a cylinder, a head and a sector. Because of this, we need to implement an LBA to CHS function that performs this conversion. I explained how this conversion works in part 2 when I talked in detail about how reading from a disk works. As a quick reminder, this is what the disk layout looks like. And we are counting in the order from the lowest to highest. Sector, heads and then cylinders. Sectors start from 1 and the rest start from 0. This is what counting these sectors looks like. Based on this counting scheme, we can use some math to figure out what the conversion formulas look like. Let's continue with the read function. The first step will obviously be converting from LBA to CHS. Then, as we learned in part 2, we attempt to read from the disk a couple of times. If the read operation fails, we need to reset the disk controller and try again. Here I noticed that the order of the cylinder head and sector arguments was inconsistent. So I swapped the arguments in the discrete method to keep the order consistent. In retrospect, it would have probably made more sense to change the LBA to CHS method. Finally, we return true if the read succeeds, otherwise false. Let's try to compile and see if we have any errors. And it looks like the compiler doesn't like that I declared the i inside the for loop. 
This is because the compiler uses C89 by default. The easy solution is to add a compiler flag to use the C99 standard. For Wattcomp that is dash ZA99. Great, we are getting another one of these division errors. This one is easy to implement, but it's just annoying to deal with. Let's figure out what the arguments are for this function. I went to the open Wattcom repository and I searched for the underscore underscore u4d symbol. What we're looking for seems to be in this i4d.asm file. And here it is. This function takes the dividend in dxax, the divisor in cxbx and the outputs are the quotient in dxax and the remainder in cxbx. We aren't planning to support any of these ancient processors that didn't have 64 by 32 bit division, so the implementation is pretty simple. We just need to shift some registers around so that we get the inputs in the right 32 bit registers do the division and then shift them again for the results. So after declaring the u4d symbol, we start by putting dx into the upper half of edx. We can do this by shifting to the left by 16 bits. Next we put ax in dx, so now we have the dividend in edx. The div instruction requires it to be in eax, so we move it there and clear edx since this is a 64 by 32 bit division. We do the same thing with the divisor. After performing the division, all that's left to do is do the reverse to get all the outputs to the correct registers. And finally we return. I'll try building it again. And this time it worked, no more errors. At this point, it might have been a good idea to test that everything works properly by writing some code to read something and print it. Don't do the same mistake that I did of not testing, as you will see later, it bit me. It's time to start working on the fat driver. Let's copy the C implementation we wrote in part 3 to the stage 2 directory. This will be our starting point. Again, we need to think a bit about how to design the public side of this code. How would we want to use these FAT functions later? Ideally, we would have an API similar to stdio.h, an fopen method that looks for the file and opens it, an fread method we can use to read, and an fclose function that will clean everything up. We also want to have a way to browse a directory and list its contents, so we will also provide a read directory entry function. It might be a good idea to do some processing on the directory entry structure so we can expose to the user a nicely formatted version, but for now let's keep things simple and just expose the raw directory entry. The packed attribute tells the GCC compiler to not add any padding to this structure, so that it matches the bytes that we have on disk. Wattcom uses a different syntax for this attribute, which is using pragma push pack1 and then pragma pop pack. This is identical to the syntax used by the Microsoft Visual C compilers. Now let's declare the functions. Don't be scared about files appearing out of nowhere. I tend to be a bit chaotic when writing code, so I change the order of the screen recording so I can tell a story that makes more sense. We will get to the implementation in just a moment. Fat initialize will do some stuff to initialize the fat driver itself, and it will take the disk as a parameter. I don't really like this because we are tying the fat driver initialization to a specific drive. However, I decided to do things this way to keep things simple, but in the future we might want to consider making it more flexible. For fat open, we need to return some sort of file handle. I decided to create a structure so we can also expose some useful fields like the file size, the current read position, whether the file is the directory or not, and the file handle. The open function will also take the path, which means that it will be capable of handling subdirectories. The fat read function will take a pointer to one of these fat file structures, a byte count and a buffer, and it will write data to that buffer. Even though the disk can only read whole sectors, this read function will be able to handle any number of bytes, 
we will have to implement some sort of buffering to make that possible. The function will return the number of bytes actually read. The read entry function is similar, except that in place of the output buffer, it will take a pointer to a directory entry structure that it will fill. This time we can simply return a boolean, true for success, false for failure. Finally, we have a fat close function that will release all the resources associated with the file. In retrospect, I should have saved the disk during initialize so I didn't have to pass it to every single function. Let's go to the implementation. Previously, we had these pointers that we allocated using malloc. We don't have malloc here, so we need to manage the memory ourselves. A simple solution you might be thinking about is to allocate memory statically using global variables, which is not a bad idea, except that these will take up space in the stage2.bin image, and we have limited space there. So what I will do instead, I will create a structure called fat data that will contain all the big buffers, and during initialization we will assign some memory manually where this data will be kept. This way we will only need to keep a pointer to that assigned memory. The first thing I added to this new fat data structure is the boot sector. The fat boot sector structure doesn't contain the boot code, only the header, so let's make things easier for us and let's use a union so that the fat boot sector structure will share the same memory with a byte buffer that is one sector in size. Then I modified the read boot sector function so it writes to the byte array in this union and called it from fat initialize. Before doing anything else, let's assign some memory for this gdata pointer that I talked about. To keep things well organized, I created a new file memdefs.h which we will use to manage the memory. I added the data regions that we know are occupied from the lower memory map on the osdef wiki. The main takeaway here is that the region between 500 and 80,000 in hexadecimal is free for us to use, which totals to approximately 500 kilobytes. Let's use 500 hexadecimal as the start of the FAT data region and use a maximum of 10,000 in hexadecimal, that is 64 kilobytes. We may need more than that for bigger drives, but if required, we can find ways to reduce our memory usage. I defined a constant which represents a far pointer. In C, the upper 16 bits of a far pointer are the segment and the lower 16 bits are the offset. So to declare address 500 in hexadecimal, we can use segment 50 and offset 0. All that's left to do is to assign this address to the gdata pointer. Next we have the gfat pointer for the file allocation table. Because we don't know how big it is in advance, let's also keep this as a far pointer that will use the memory right after the gdata structure. Something to consider here is that keeping the entire file allocation table in memory may not be feasible for large drives, where you might end up with hundreds of megabytes. In the future, we should consider replacing this with a cache that only keeps some parts of the file allocation table entries. After assigning this pointer, we will do some checks to make sure that we don't use more memory than we should, and then we will read the file allocation table. 
also did the same thing for the root directory pointer, so it uses the memory right after the file allocation table, but in the end I used a different approach that we'll get back to in a bit. Let's think for a moment about fat open. What this function has to do is to first split the path into its component parts and then iterate through each of these components. We begin by opening the root directory, then as we iterate, we will search inside the currently opened directory for the next item in the path. Then, once we find it, we close the current folder and open the new item. Fat open will only process the path string, but the actual opening of files will be done by a supporting function, fat open directory entry, which will perform the other steps required for opening a file. Let's begin by implementing some of the supporting functions that we will need, starting with the string functions needed to parse the path. The first function we will implement is string char from the C standard library. This function searches for a character in a string and returns a pointer to the first match or null if there is no match. The implementation is pretty straightforward. We iterate through the string until we encounter a match. Once we have a match, we return a pointer to the match location. If we have reached the end of the string and haven't found any match, we can return null. The next function we will need is string copy, which copies a string from one buffer to another. This is another function that's very easy to implement. We advance both the source and the destination pointers at the same time and we copy until the source character becomes zero. We also need to append a zero character to the end of the destination string. The edge cases are if the source or the destination are null. If the destination is null, we don't have to do anything, but if the source is null, we should append a zero character to the destination. Next, let's create a file data structure that will contain all the information we need to read from a file. The first thing we will keep in this structure will be the fat file structure we created earlier, which will contain the data we will return to the user, which is why I called it public. This structure will get quite big, so allowing the user to store it on the stack doesn't sound like a very good idea. Also, the user doesn't need to access the information stored here directly. So we will keep a number of these structures in an array we will call opened files, which will be stored in the fat data structure. When the user will request a file to be opened, we will search the array for an empty slot where no file is opened. The file handle will simply be an index into this array. The size of the array will give us the maximum number of files that can be opened at the same time. I set the size to 10 for now, but if we need more free memory we can decrease this number, if we need more files, we can increase it later. We would also like to treat the root directory as a normal file that can be opened and read using the public functions, but because it needs some special treatment, I added it as a separate entry. Let's go back to file data and add a few other things that we will need. First, we need to tell if one of these file data slots is free or taken, so let's add an opened boolean field. 
You also need to keep track of where we are in the file, which means the current cluster and the current sector in cluster. We will add a buffer here as well that is as large as one sector, since this is the minimum we can read from a disk at one time. Using this buffer we significantly increase the read speed, as we don't have to repeat reads to get the different bytes from the same sector. Let's think about the root directory for a minute. As I already mentioned, we would like to be able to treat it like a normal file that can be opened and read. Let's see how to fill this structure. We decided that the file handles are indices into the table, so let's define a special value that can be in the table as the file handle for the root directory. Since we cannot have negative indices, let's use minus one. We will mark the root directory as opened, its directory to true and the position to zero. We already calculated the size of the root directory in the code above, so we can fill it in here. Because the root directory doesn't appear in the file allocation table, the current cluster doesn't make much sense, but we can still use it to store the current sector. We will keep the root directory always opened. The close method will only reset it to the beginning. To achieve that, we should also set the first cluster, or in this case, the first sector. Finally, we want to read the first sector of the root directory into the buffer. I copied the calculation from the read root directory function and I forgot to set first and current cluster fields. I will discover this bug later. The fat read root directory method is now obsolete, so let's delete it after moving the calculation for the data area location to fat initialize. Let's also initialize the opened files array. In this case, we will only need to set the opened flag to false. Now we can implement the open directory entry function. First, we need to search for an unopened entry into the file table, which will be our handle. If we cannot find any empty slot, we will return a null pointer and print an error message that we have run out of handles. Next, we need to fill all the fields of the file data structure, just like we did for the root directory. We already know the handle, so we will set it. To figure out if the directory entry is a directory or not, we need to look at the directory entry attributes. We haven't added the enum that describes these attributes yet, so let's do that right now. Notice that these are flags. What this means is that each attribute takes one bit of the attributes field. To verify if an attribute is set, we have to perform an AND operation, which will mask out all the other bits. A non-zero value means that the attribute is set. The initial position is zero since we want to read from the beginning of the file. The size is also filled in the directory entry structure that I also forgot to set, another bug future me will have to discover. 
The first cluster is split into two words, so we will add them together. The current cluster is the same as the first cluster and the current sector in cluster is 0. Finally, we read the first sector of the file into the buffer. If this operation was a success, we will set the opened flag to true and return a pointer to the public part of our structure. Because we assigned a memory address that's not in the current segment, we should mark this returned pointer as far. To convert a cluster to a sector, I created a helper method. This is equal to the begin sector of the data section plus the cluster minus 2 multiplied by the number of sectors per cluster. We can finally implement fat open. I first declare the buffer that's long enough to hold the folder name. By default in Windows, paths are limited to 255 characters, so that's the limit I used. I also skipped any leading slash character. We will start our search in the root directory and we will loop over each component of the path. Inside the loop I used the string char to search for the next slash symbol in the path. If we find another slash symbol, we'll copy the characters between the path pointer and the delim pointer to the name buffer using memcopy. After adding a null character at the end of the name, we advance the path pointer to the next character after the slash. If the path doesn't contain any more slashes, that means we have reached the last component in the path. Same as before, we copy the string to the name buffer including the null character at the end. To exit the loop, I advance the path to the null character at the end. In this code, we used two functions we haven't implemented yet, memcopy and string length. So let's go ahead and implement them. We will do the naive implementation for these functions, even though there are far more efficient ways of doing things. Many of these string and memory functions can be heavily optimized by using simd instructions, which are some special CPU instructions that can do certain data processing operations very fast by taking advantage of parallelism. The limitation is that they are simple operations that don't need any thinking. These are things like copying some memory to some other location or maybe applying a color correction to an image. On the x86 there are a number of these instruction sets including 3D Now, MMX, SSE, SSE2 and so on. The implementations from the C standard library do use these features when they are available. Even using the rep instruction makes a difference, so there are easy ways of improving our performance by writing an assembly. For teaching purposes, I prefer to take the easier route, but when you are designing your own operating system, you should consider these things. Back to the open function. The next step is to search the currently open directory for the entry that has the name we just extracted. We will use the find file function we had before with some modifications. After completing the search, we can close the current directory as we won't need it anymore. If we find the entry, we will open it using the open directory entry function. We should also check that if this is not the last item in the path, it is actually a directory and not a file. 
Otherwise, we may end up interpreting the contents of a file as directory entries. If the directory entry is not found, we simply display an error message and return null. Finally, we will return the current file. To be able to search for the directory entries, we need to be able to read. So let's continue with the read method. First, we need to get the file data structure that the handle references. I also cast the data out pointer to a byte array since a void pointer isn't very helpful for us. Reading will work by copying data from the buffer until there is no data left in the buffer. When that happens, we refill the buffer by reading a new, fresh sector from the disk. These steps will repeat until there are no more bytes to read. That happens either when the byte count reaches zero or we reach the end of the file. In the loop, we must first calculate how many bytes we can copy from the buffer and put it in the take variable. That would be the minimum number between the number of bytes requested, the number of bytes left in the file and the number of bytes left in the buffer. We can calculate how many bytes are left in the buffer by taking the remainder of the position divided by the buffer size and subtracting it from the buffer size. Next, we copy the data from the buffer into the output buffer and advance by take bytes. We have to advance the file position as well as the output buffer and subtract from the byte count. Since the file size doesn't change during the loop, we can move this calculation outside of the while loop. Now we need to think if we consume the entire buffer. I did this by checking if byte count is greater than zero, which means that there are more bytes to read. This wasn't the right way of checking this, as you will see later. To read the next sector, we advance the current sector in cluster field. If it becomes greater than the number of sectors per cluster, then we need to make a lookup in the file allocation table to obtain the next cluster. We should also check that the next cluster isn't greater than FF8, because that would mean we are reading past the end of the file. If the file size field in the directory entry is correct, this should never happen, but it's better to be safe. Finally, we refill the buffer by reading the next sector. Once all the bytes have been read, we will return the number of bytes read. We can do this by subtracting the original output buffer pointer from the output buffer pointer we incremented. We will also need some code to handle the root directory, which needs some special handling. In this case, we won't use the current sector in cluster at all, and we will consider that the current cluster field is the current sector. So when we finish reading from the buffer, we only need to advance to the next sector without any fat lookup, and read that into the buffer. <laughs> 
the read fat entry function is very simple. We just call read and we read exactly the size of a directory entry. We return true if the number of bytes we read are equal to the size of the structure. The close function is also pretty easy. If the handle is the root directory's handle, we just need to reset to the beginning. This means resetting the current cluster, the position, and reading the first sector into the buffer. For normal files or directories, all we need to do is mark them as not opened. Last but not least, we have the find file method. Instead of this for loop, we'll simply call the fat read entry function to read the directory entries until it returns false. Something we have to do here as well is to convert from the nice file name we got to the uppercase 8.3 format used by the fat file system. We will need some additional functions to perform this task, namely to upper is lower, memset and memcompare. The implementation of these is pretty straightforward. With that out of the way, let's get back to find file. I created a 13 character buffer called fat name and filled it with the padding character, which is space. Next, we need to extract the file's extension. We will do that by searching for the period character with string char. Something I haven't thought of in this implementation is that if a file contains multiple period characters, this search will look for the first occurrence, not the last one. After that, I copied up to 8 characters from the name and up to 3 from the extension. Finally, I used memcompare to check if the current directory entry matches what we have stored in fat name. If it does, we will return the current directory entry. Looks like we're pretty much done. We no longer need this main function, so we can delete it. Now that we are done with the implementation, let's write some code to test it from the main function. First, we need to declare and initialize the disk and then the fat driver. For this first test, I wanted to see if reading the root directory works correctly, so I printed all the files in the root directory. Time to test this thing. And it looks like we have some compilation issues that I'll fix in just a moment. Regarding the minimum and maximum functions, I define these two as macros in stdint.h. There are some issues with the way I define these. 
Obviously, STD int is not the best place to put them, but the main issue here is that I use the A and B arguments twice. This can have unintended and unexpected consequences. For example, if we write minimum of A++ and B, A++ will be evaluated twice. This behavior can surprise you when you least expect it. Unfortunately, there isn't any clean way of doing this in C. C++ templates work a lot better for implementing these functions. I fixed all the issues, so let's try to compile again. Oh, come on, another one of these division functions. You know the drill, search in the Whatcom sources, see what the function does and what are its parameters, and implement it in assembly. U4M is in fact a 4-byte multiplication which can be easily done with some byte shifting. It is supported by all the CPUs that we want to support. Yay, the compilation finally succeeded. Let's see if it works. And what in the world is this? It appears that we have some bugs. I went ahead and investigated every bug I could find and recorded most of it. I will present a shorter version of the steps I took in my investigation since the whole process took me about 3 hours to find and fix all the issues. We haven't spent a lot of time debugging in this series and I think this is a very important thing to learn. I hope that this part will be useful to get an idea on how debugging works. I won't go into too much detail about how to use each of the tools that we have, but let me know in the comments if you want me to make some videos explaining how to use Box or Camo with GDB or any other debugging tool. There are three main techniques I used for debugging. Printing things to the screen with printf, step-by-step -step debugging with either Box which supports step-by-step -step debugging or Camo which exposes an interface that GDB can connect to, and extracting code to the host machine and debugging it there with the usual debugging tools. My first thought was that I was reading past the end of the root directory, so the first thing I tried was to limit how many entries I showed. I was still getting garbage, which means that something else was wrong. I decided to try debugging on the host machine, so I copied the fat driver and the disk functions, and also the main file, to toolsfat. Then I created a proper make file, the previous one only compiled a single fat.c file. After getting the make file working, I started to fix all the compilation issues I had. For the disk methods, I replaced the implementation and used the file functions from stdio.h. Then I changed the main function so it opens a disk image from the command line. Another issue I had to fix was the memory allocation in fat.c. We can't obviously just assign some random memory when we are a program running in another operating system. After managing to get the program to compile and run on the host machine, to no one's surprise, it segfaulted. After debugging the issue, it turned out to be just a memory management issue in fat initialize, one of these direct memory assignments that I missed. After replacing it with a malloc and trying to run again, I got a big surprise. The program actually worked. So it looks like some parts of the code do work properly. I was still baffled. My code worked on the host machine, but not when running as part of my operating system. What could possibly be wrong? I wasn't sure what the problem was. Not knowing where to begin, I thought about trying to debug with Box. When I did that, Box was giving me a read error, but not in my own code, but in the BIOS code. When you see many Fs in the address, that means that the code executing is inside the BIOS. No matter what I tried, I was getting the same issue with the BIOS. I gave up on Box for the moment, and I started adding many printfs, trying to figure out what is not working properly. I started with the fat initialize function, verifying if all the memory addresses are assigned properly and the calculations are good. 
Here is where I found my first bug. For the root directory, I forgot to assign the first cluster variable and the current cluster. If I wouldn't have fixed this now, I would have encountered problems when reading the second root directory sector, since the first sector was read properly in this initialize function. Obviously, this didn't fix the issue I was having. My next suspect was the fat read method. It is one of the uglier and more complicated ones. Something I find annoying is that we cannot scroll when running the operating system to see all the output, so we have to limit the amount of output that we print. Something a lot of operating systems do to address this issue is that they output debugging information to a serial port. Box and Camo can be configured pretty easily to print the serial output to the standard output. This isn't very hard to do, maybe we will do it at some point. I still wasn't sure what was wrong, so I thought to print the data I was getting from the disk. I still wasn't sure what was wrong, so I thought to print the data I was getting from the disk, and then to search for it in the disk image using a hex editor. After finding the root directory in the disk image and comparing to what data I was actually reading, I realized that I was reading from the wrong place. This is where it finally clicked. Something is wrong in the disk reading methods. My first hunch was that maybe the BIOS wanted the output address to be aligned to some value, so I moved the buffer to a different position within the file data structure. I did get something else, so I wasn't wrong about that, but this still didn't make much sense. Next, I wanted to figure out where I was actually reading from, so I searched in the hex editor for the first few bytes of my data, and I did find it. It was from offset 4A00, which means sector 37. This made no sense, I was requesting a read for sector 19. After adding some printfs to the discrete method, I saw a strange issue. The cylinder was out of whack. It couldn't be correct that I was reading from cylinder 65510. That means that the issue is coming from the LBA to CHS conversion. I verified all the formulas, but they looked correct. If all the formulas are correct, then the issue has to be with the input data. So I printed all the information about the disk. This is when the problem was revealed to me, and I missed it. I didn't see what was in front of my eyes. A 1.44 MB floppy disk has 1440 kilobytes, which means 2880 total sectors. From the numbers I was seeing here, one head multiplied by 18 sectors multiplied by 79 cylinders only gives a total of 1442 sectors, far fewer than it should have been. So this was the actual problem. I again missed it when looking for some online LBA2 CHS calculator. On this particular site, I selected the 1.44 MB disk and it showed me that the correct geometry was 2 heads, 80 cylinders and 18 sectors. This is what happens when you are too tired. I had a long day, didn't get enough sleep, so I was tired. And this is what happens when you are tired, you miss things. I was so close to the truth. Not seeing the problem, I had some other ideas about what could be wrong. At some point I thought that maybe I messed up one of these division functions, so I tested some divisions to make sure that they were correct. I thought that maybe I passed some parameter wrong to the BIOS functions, so I verified all the code multiple times. At least something good came up of that, as I managed to fix box. I tried again to debug in box, but that BIOS image issue didn't go away. I thought that maybe the BIOS file got corrupted somehow, or maybe an update broke it. I first tried changing the BIOS ROM to the legacy version, but what I didn't know at the time was that I should have removed the address parameter, which is why it didn't work. Reading through the manuals, I found about this C BIOS that should also work with box, so I tried that. Of course, I didn't try removing the address line, so it didn't work. After trying to guess the address, I finally removed it, and then the BIOS worked. I was able to debug. What still didn't work for me was the display. I was getting a black screen. In any case, I was happy that I could debug, so I carried on debugging. I used the stage 2 map file generated by the linker to find the address of the disk read method, and then put a breakpoint there and started debugging. I checked that the registers are set correctly for the int 13 hexadecimal call and they looked good to me. At this point I still wanted to see what was being printed on the screen so I could check if 
the inputs were correct, so I set out to fix the display issue with Box. The first thing I tried was to change the display library, SDL2 had some issues, but I could also use X and WX. Some extra packages need to be installed for these graphical frontends, Box-X and Box-WX. This didn't make much of a difference, so the next thing I tried was to use a different video BIOS. The documentation mentioned some other BIOSes that were available, but I couldn't find them in my installation. Turns out that these can be found in the git repository in the BIOS folder or in the releases. At some point I stopped the video recording, but the combination that finally worked for me was to get the 2.7 pre-release tarball and use the BIOS box latest image with the VGA BIOS LPIN 2.40. After a long time and a lot more debugging, I finally found the problem with the wrong number of heads and cylinders. What was happening was that the BIOS get drive parameters function was returning the head minus one and the cylinder minus one. To fix this issue, I modified the disk initialize method to add one to these two values. After fixing this issue, I finally got what I was expecting, the list of files in the root directory. My next test was to see if we could read a file from the root directory, so I printed the contents of test.txt and I was getting a file not found error. What I suspected the issue to be was the code that converted from the normal file name to the 8.3 format expected by FAT. After printing the converted file name, it looks like my intuition was correct. I forgot to call to upper for the extension and also I didn't skip over the period character when adding the file extension. After fixing these issues, I still wasn't getting the contents of the file. So I started debugging the read function again. This time I debugged using the host program after I copied all the bug fixes and modifications. This way I found that I forgot to set the length in the fat open entry function. After fixing that issue as well, I got the contents of the test.txt file. My third test was to read something from a subdirectory, to see if all the path parsing stuff that I implemented worked correctly. So I modified the make file to create a subdirectory and place a file in there. The mmd command from the mtools suite can be used to create a directory. Of course, this didn't work either. I didn't trust my name to 8.3 conversion, so I decided to print the raw bytes. Lo and behold, we have some null characters in there. Where did these come from? Then I realized my mistake. I was copying up to 8 characters from the file name without checking if the string ended. After fixing this issue, I got a different error. This time my dir was found, but test.txt wasn't found. To investigate this issue, I copied the changes to the host program and tried debugging there. This is where I found an oddity about fat. Subdirectories don't have any length, their length is zero. I also found a note about it on the Wikipedia article about the design of FAT, saying that the file size is zero for volume labels or subdirectories. To fix this issue, I added this edge case to FAT's read. If the current file is a directory and its size is zero, then allow reading past the end of the file. After fixing this issue, I got another success. Reading from subdirectories now works. My final test was to create a really big file and make sure that it can be read properly. And I found another bug. Instead of the file contents, I'm getting some read errors and something that doesn't look like that big text file at all. Just like before, I started debugging on the host machine. On the host, I was getting the text, but I wasn't sure if this was correct. After going step by step through the part where the disk was being read with the debugger, I didn't see anything wrong. After letting the entire program run, I noticed that the end didn't really match my file. To figure out where things started to go wrong, I redirected all the output to a file and then used a diff tool to compare and see if any parts were missing. What I noticed was that at some point the text was cut off and a portion of the text was being repeated. This was a strange issue. I tried to do more debugging, but it was pretty hard to get to the right place where the issue was happening. So I opened the big file.txt in a hex editor to try to find the offset to where that cutoff was happening.
After getting that offset, I headed a conditional breakpoint in this read loop to try to get as close to the issue as possible. After a lot of debugging, I finally figured out what the problem was. I was only reading from the disk when the byte count was greater than zero. However, if my buffer had 30 bytes left and I read exactly 30 bytes, byte count would be zero, but the buffer would be empty. The fix was to perform the read not when bytes left was greater than zero, but when left in buffer was equal to take. In other words, we have to read when we have taken all the bytes left in the buffer. After fixing this issue and rerunning the program, the files were now identical, so we found and fixed another issue. I added the fix in the stage 2 code as well, and after running, I was still getting some strange results. I tried printing a shorter portion of the file when I saw this issue with the new lines. When printing using BIOS routines, the line feed characters only moves the cursor down, but it doesn't move it to the beginning of the line. Because of this, to print a new line, you need to add a carriage return as well. Since I'm editing this file on Linux, my line endings only have the line feed. I fixed this issue in the main function by inserting a carriage return when encountering a line feed. The output looks much better now, and after removing this debugging printf, it looks even better. I increased the number of bytes displayed, and this is when I saw another issue. After the first 512 bytes, I was getting empty spaces instead of the data that I was expecting. This didn't happen on the host, only in my bootloader. Again, I began the painstaking process of adding many printfs to the code, trying to figure out what is wrong this time. To my surprise, none of my printfs appeared on the screen. Guess what? I was editing the host fat.c file, not the stage 2 file. Great. After adding the printfs to the correct file, I saw that the next cluster didn't look right. We haven't written that much data to the disk to get to cluster 3000. I suspected that maybe we're not reading the fat correctly, so I tried printing the file allocation table, but it looked correct. It didn't make much sense. The FED was correct, the index calculations were correct, but these two return lines were returning the wrong thing. Why? I printed the actual bytes in the FED at that index and they also looked correct, but for some reason these return lines didn't work correctly. After banging my head on the table a few times, more printing stuff to the screen, hoping to figure out what was going on, thinking about giving up and going to sleep, Wondering about life's meaning, asking myself what I did so wrong that I ended up here, I realized something. I was in 16-bit real mode and I converted the GFAT pointer, which was a far pointer, to a UIN16T near pointer. After adding that magic word far, the issue was fixed. Finally, we have a working FAT driver. Just before finishing, I wanted to fix one minor thing. Since subdirectories have a size of 0, that means that we have to read them until we get to that big cluster number, that's above FF8. So it isn't right that we are showing an error message here. What we can actually do is set the proper size in the file structure and then just break. Now that we fixed all the issues, it's time to remove all the debugging printf since we no longer need them. That was a lot of work, and even though things got a bit frustrating, I'm glad I could show you that when writing operating systems, things don't always go the way you want. This is why learning how to debug stuff is extremely important, and I hope this video was useful in that regard. Next time we have some new exciting stuff on the table, we are finally going into protected mode. Thank you a lot for your attention, and... If you want to join us on Discord, you can find the link in the video description below. Maybe you have some questions, maybe you got stuck somewhere, or maybe you just want to talk with other people who are interested in low-level programming. You're free to join us on Discord, the link is in the description below. Again, thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye bye!